Who owns the investments in your portfolio? You worked hard, you made some money, and you decided you want to invest. Maybe you bought some Apple, or you bought some Tesla. Good job. Now you've got these shares, but do you own them? Under the American corporate system, the shareholders are supposed to be the owners of the company. And the company and the board are supposed to work for your interests. But in 21st century America, this system appears to be under assault. We told you about the multi-trillion dollars allocated to ESG funds worldwide and how these are changing the priorities of investments. We've explained the huge push to make every company serve stakeholders rather than shareholders. This means that the company is supposed to serve all of society and not just the people who worked hard to buy the stock. We've discussed how the actual owners of investments are being shoved aside through corporate proxies and resolutions that typically have a far left agenda. We've talked about how China has been accessing your pensions and our money to the tune of $3 trillion or more. And here again, Chinese companies under Chinese law have to serve the Chinese Communist Party. American shareholders have virtually no rights. You're not even allowed to see the books of a Chinese company. These are all planned and perpetrated efforts of the globalist elite to remake society with the gateway drug of socialism. But is this what the investors really want? Is this what you want? We undertook a national poll to find out the truth. The results may surprise you. Join me in the Economic War Room as we examine the findings with noted pollster John McLaughlin. We wanted to find out what American investors really want with their portfolios. So we engaged with noted pollster John McLaughlin. John, welcome to the Economic War Room. It's a pleasure to be with you. And thanks for taking the survey. Oh. <laughs> so. We, we so appreciate what you did for us. We know you do a lot of polls, especially in the political arena. So this has got to be a really busy time before the election. It is, I, and but it's a critical time. And you talk about such a unique time for to to measure public opinion so uh and your survey was done in june of uh, um, among a thousand likely voters people who are tuned in on the presidential race in congress so uh, it, uh it's it's really timely in terms of the issues and what you're finding right now yeah well you've been described as president trump's favorite pollster what's, <laughs> what's it like working with the president well, he won. That's why I was his favorite. But he, so he made me look good. So uh, uh, so we're, we're working hard right now. If I look tired or if I look like I, I've been churning data all night, that's the reason why. So we're in a very close race and things are things are good. Things are they, I mean, they're having a great convention for the Republicans this week. And uh, the president has met historic challenges that you can see in your own surveys where a global pandemic, recession level, high unemployment, uh, you've had uh, the rioting, looting in some cities and, and a rise in crime. And the president's meeting all these historic challenges and uh, his, his numbers are going up, which is very good. Yeah, well, it, it's difficult to try and get the pulse of America with all these cross currents going on. But you do it through science, through a scientific polling approach. Tell us about the way you undertake a poll. Well, specifically, the survey that we're going to talk about is... Uh, based on a thousand likely voters across the country. So what you've got is you've got, I mean, there's plenty of election data. There's voter uh, uh, databases with every voter in America on them. So what we do is, is, is we take a survey of a thousand likely voters that's based on a national distribution in, in uh, national elections, uh, particularly from the last presidential election, where 33% of the voters were Republicans, 37% were Democrats. So we set that model. We have the right uh, areas, race, gender, age. We're, we're very strict about quality controls because polls are an inexact science. Uh, and then we ask people if they're actually going to vote, because if they're not going to vote, it doesn't really affect public policy. So uh, there's a lot of polls out there with just adults, um, there's 237 million eligible voters in the United States, adult eligible voters. And in the last presidential election, we had a record turnout 
of 139 million voters, wow. which was no, which was nine million more than Romney and Obama. But that was a historic turnout. But that means that you had about 80 million voters who are eligible didn't vote. And if you include them in the surveys, that's why you're wrong. So this time it's going to be even higher than the 139 million because of the issues at, 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 at hand. So you'll have over 150 million eligible voters. Um, and you got to go state by state, figure out what the turnout is, and you figure out who's coming out to vote, and you screen them by likely voters. And the national polls and national elections don't mean as much as the state battleground polls. Right. So there's about 17, 18 battleground states right now where most of the time and effort uh, between the candidates are being spent. And then we've got the races for Senate and Congress, too. So it's a you talk about a historic. We thought 2016 was a historic election. This year in 2020, you're going to see a really consequential historic election. Yeah. So in the middle of that, we try we interrupted you in your traditional uh, political polling. And we asked you to look at Americans and what they think about their investments and how they've been right. politicized with, uh, you know, we use the buzzword ESG, which stands for environment, social, just social justice and governance, which is really right. built around broad gender diversity and broad diversity efforts. So. In a sense, what we were asking were political questions because ESG is very much a political idea. Uh, and going into it, we knew that there seemed to be a clear left-right divide on a lot of those things. And you know, in my opinion, the left gets the idea of weaponizing money and using investments for political purposes. The right, not so much. Um, right. So. You know, we, you started this poll, and, and we're going to have to take a break in a minute, but briefly tell us what, what you were asking, what, what we were looking for. What we were asking is, is about, about their values and, and how it affects their investments. And besides the political polling, half our work is corporate. I have an MBA in quantitative methods and finance, and so we have a lot of corporate clients and business clients that do work with us. And... It's always a challenge between the greatest return because your your own self interest guides a lot of this, um, and and at the same time your values. So we've never seen the kind of socialist challenge that we're seeing in the United States right now ever. And uh, really, what's what's detrimental is our opponents in the Democratic Party have really their their socialist wing is really moving a lot of their uh, policies and their positions for the future. John, we're so, going to have uh, to take a break here. But when okay. we come back, we're going to dig into the findings that you got with one of America's top pollsters, John McLaughlin. <laughs> Talking with John McLaughlin, one of the best pollsters in the industry. He's been described as President Trump's favorite pollster. Well, John, you took a poll for us uh, a few weeks back. Tell us, what did you ask and what did you find? Well, we asked right up front, we asked uh, these 1,000 likely voters across the country, people who decide the presidential race in Congress. We asked them uh, when they're making decisions for their personal investments or savings, which of the files do you agree with most? We had one choice in there where we said, I want my financial company to invest according to their views of social values as more important consideration than my returns. Because that's what you've got going on now. People trying to that's control exactly your investments right. by uh, for their social values, their policies. Only 8% of all voters agreed with that. Wow. Most wow. Americans said they want, they, they want the greatest return regardless. That's 35%. And 38%. 
I want them to invest for the greatest returns, but I want them to invest according to my values. So you really got seven in 10 voters who don't want them <laughs> investing uh, according to these social uh, guidelines, which really don't have anything to do with the investor values or anything to do with getting a return. And yeah. that's what it's their savings. It's their money. 70 percent. That seems like a big number to me. Is that normal? Yeah, that's in a your big polls? <laughs> That's a big number. Statistically, the margin of error in the survey is plus or minus 3%. It's well outside the margin of error. So uh, so most people don't like the idea of, of this social investing uh, where you're sacrificing returns or you're investing against the values of, of the person whose money it is. So, um, and, and by the way, over half the voters, they have five, 401ks. They have, uh, you know, s significant savings so that this it is really meaningful. matters to them. Yeah. Right. Right. And and the challenge, too, is a lot of Americans, even though it's only half, a lot of Americans don't have that kind of savings, which is a real challenge for us in policy. So um, we also asked, generally speaking, would you rather invest financially in efforts that promote ideals and concepts of socialism or encourage growth through capitalism and free markets? And what did you find? They said capitalism, free markets, 56%. But to me, the scary part is the 22% who said socialism. So, so that is that's scary. a real challenge. Yeah. And no, the no. ones with the savings of 401ks, they're saying 63% capitalism. So it's a bigger number. But um, still, and, it's a majority. And, and yes. it's, a major it's enough to win an election if, if, if this were running a candidate for a campaign. But, but it is scary. There has been this concerted effort by the media and by the educational institutions to promote socialism, and they've gained ground in the past 10 years. I have no yes. doubt about that. Yes, and, the, and, and absolutely, when you look at the, I'll put on my partisan hat for a second, when you look at Bernie Sanders got Joe Biden to sign a 110-page unity agreement. And in that unity agreement, as a lot of socialist policies and younger voters really don't understand what socialism is. And the uh, the president has made it quite clear that America will never be a socialist country. He right. said it in the State of the Union before. He's saying it during his Republican convention. And uh, and by the way, most American voters agree with that. And and what's scary, though, is, the, is Democrats, it's 30 percent agree with it. socialism, 42 percent. So it's really inside their party which if they get control of the presidency, the Senate, the House, you're going to see the tail wagging the dog. And the uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, you'll see them, uh, Elizabeth Warren, they will be enacting socialist policies uh, if, if we're not successful. And that's a scary thought. That is, yep. So what else did the poll show? We also asked them, do you support or uh, approve or disapprove of your wealth being invested by a company that promotes itself as friendly to the environment, advocates for social justice, and supports good corporate governance, but directs investments towards Chinese co companies that violate all three? Because it's a big issue, the idea of communist China runs their businesses. Right. And uh, 50 to 34 percent, they disapprove. Well, so I'm glad that 50 percent do disapprove. This is kind of the hypocrisy question. I mean, this is yes. Larry Fink and BlackRock. They're very ESG friendly, but then they'll stick money in Chinese companies that are clearly not following the same principles. Right. And they don't put and it's really unfair to American businesses because they don't play by the same rules. So so our companies will operate by certain things regarding environmental regulations. I mean, that that's why so many businesses have outsourced to China because they don't have the same rules on environment, on wages, on on how you treat your workers. Um, you know, so it's and the Chinese companies can also subcontract to North Korea or oh, some other country. And so those sneakers and textiles that you're buying, clothes that you're buying, it's not just China, but the but uh, uh, but it's not a, they don't operate by our values. So it's a it's a it's not good. It's an uneven playing field, yes. and it undermines American companies entirely, because right. if they if they get to pollute, if they get to violate all of these things, uh, they get a competitive advantage. And and then the economists step back, the free market people, and I'm a free market guy, but only when there's a level playing field. And they'll right. step back and they'll say, oh no no, if they can do it cheaper and cheaper and better, let them do it. 
even if it has this massive social cost and we have our hands tied in American companies and can't even compete against that. And again, putting on my partisan hat, that's the great thing that President Trump has done. He's the first president that we've ever known that has stood up to China in terms of uh, trade. No doubt. Uh, and with the negotiations, et cetera. And, and when you look at the, all the trade deals that he, he's revised, I mean, the NAFTA deal, uh, the uh, uh, the idea that he was able to renegotiate with Mexico and Canada, the idea that he was able to uh, redo the trade deal with South South Korea and other countries where, uh, unfortunately, they don't play by the same rules. So now he's making giving it that even playing field so American businesses can take advantage of the lower taxes in the United States because he also lowered taxes and, be, and bring manufacturing jobs home, which is a great thing. No, it's absolutely. And in fact, it, the national security concerns are in there as well. And I yes. was actually a consultant to the Pentagon uh, back at the tail end of the Bush administration and the beginning of the Obama administration. I can tell you what you said. There's not been an American president that has taken chi the China threat seriously. Not in mm -hmm. my lifetime. And I was there on the front lines. In fact, I was at, a, at, at an event uh, recently uh, where a good friend introduced me and she said, yep, I remember Kevin was the first one a dozen years ago who said China's a threat. And I asked, does anybody else think that China's a threat? And there was no, and this is a very sophisticated audience, no one else a dozen years ago thought as China. They thought they were our friend, they were our banker, they are all, so forth. But President Trump gets it and he's surrounded mm -hmm. himself with people who understand. So we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we need to talk about this, what it all means for investors, for advisors, and for the voting public. So take a break, come back with us with John McLaughlin. talking in the economic war room with John McLaughlin and we're talking about uh, what investors want and how this will impact the election and your future. So John, dive in a little further on the poll that you did for us. Sure. Now there were, there were four concepts you asked about where you rated them how important it was to these voters on a scale of zero to ten uh, and, and how, it would, how important it would be regarding their personal financial investments. And of the four, the one that scored the most had investing in companies that are focused on bringing back jobs and economic prosperity to America. And it was 7.65. Is that so a good number? Jobs, they want to bring jobs back to America. That sounds and, good. Which is a great patriotic thing. It's really good for investors and good for voters. But it also tells you where America is right now. And ensuring that my international investments do not fund adversaries like Iran, North Korea, China that are working against U.S. interests. That was second, 7.29, a good number from good. the zero to 10. That's important to them. The next concept was ensuring that I'm not investing in companies and countries that are persecuting religious minorities and Christians. That came out at 7.03. So they really don't want to see them their investments used to help countries who persecute, persecute Christians, fund our adversaries, and they really want to bring jobs back to America, which is great concepts for uh, the investors and the voters. We also tested a fourth one where we said investing your wealth with companies who prioritize human rights and social justice issues at the foundation of their operations, including funding movements such as Black Lives Matters and, it enforces, and its efforts to defund police departments and achieve criminal justice reform. That one came right in the middle of 5.5. That's a lukewarm number. There's really not 
of, of one of the concepts that they really want to be one of their goals. Well, that's encouraging. No, and it's and it just shows you that jobs don't fund our adversaries. Uh, also, uh, don't help people who are persecuting Christians. Those are really bad ideas. Those are our better concepts. Those are the better goals. The social justice goals goals don't score as well with voters overall or with investors. Good. So that, that's reassuring. <laughs> so, um, And then we asked the question, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? And this is a big number. My preference is a financial advisor broker who, like myself, as it relates to values, interests, and politics. They want somebody who's their financial advisor or broker who's like them. 74% agree, only 12% disagree. And what you've got is you've got Republicans saying 83 to 8, Democrats 70 to 16, Independents 70 to 12, Conservatives 76 to 11, Moderates 70 to 15, Liberals 78 to 10. People want their investor or their advisor for their investments to represent their values, to be like them. And that's not unusual. And you probably see that all the time. No, in the industry, the, the mantra is, don't be political, don't show who you are, stay as neutral as possible. But your findings are that advisors really should reflect what they believe. And they'll get, left or right, they'll tend to gain more clients. Right, and most often, I mean, for those of us speaking from human experience, it's your friends and families. Who do you recommend? And most of it's, it's coming from somebody that you may know from church, you may know from uh, family connection. They they naturally share your values and your interests, and uh, and and that just seems like good marketing sense. And I'll bet you a lot more of them use it than you realize. So uh, the next time your college friend calls up and asks how your investments are, <laughs> you'll know why. Yeah. Um, and then we had an agree disagree. I want the person who manages my retirement funds to understand how geopolitical dynamics can impact my investments. So we don't live just in, in our isolated world. We really want those investments. Uh, to, we want to understand how it's going to impact, impact the world. 79 to 9, they agree with that statement. Wow. Now, let yes. me tell you something. On the cover of the CFA magazine, I hold the Chartered Financial Analyst designation a few years back. There was a quote from an industry expert that says, our industry really does not understand how geopolitical dynamics impact investments. So the right. industry, the broad industry doesn't get it. But what you're saying is the investors want that. And that's why we do economic war room training. That's exactly right. why we do it, to help, help get these advisors up to speed, because that's what their clients want. And of the majority of Americans who have a 401k and they have significant savings for their retirements, that number is 83 to 9. So they they want their their advisor, they want their broker to have the understanding that you have, have the understanding that you're you're educating people with, and they want to know how their investments are going to affect the geopolitical dynamics. And you've seen it from the previous questions. They want to know how it's going to affect American jobs. They want to know that they're not helping our adversaries they want to put their country first they also want to make sure that it's not hurting people that are like them like other christians other people who believe in freedom democracy capitalism they want to be able to say i'm not only making a return on my dollars but i can feel good about what i'm doing because it's there's an intersection of values and there's an intersection of investments where you're getting the return for the values that you hold Wow. What you did was phenomenal, Paul, and, and the survey is very helpful to us. You know, we looked at other surveys that were done. There's a Wall Street Journal NBC News poll. It says among people 55 and older, nearly 80 percent said patriotism was very important compared with 42 percent of those ages 18 to 38. Well, why that's right. so important to us is, uh, according to a, a bank, uh, Nielsen Media Research, the baby boom, 55 plus, controls 70 percent of the nation's disposable income so we're, we're finding this in other polls here mmi did a survey and they said arts and culture corporate governance diversity religion climate solutions cor sustainable corporate practices environmental protection human rights social justice all of those were well below the two top priorities my country and family does any of that surprise you given what you your survey said uh, no it doesn't surprise me and we the survey that uh, you, we did for you that we helped. We do monthly surveys that we publish that we put on McLaughlinOnline.com, 
And what there's a huge generational shift. And the difference is the generational experiences of those people that have wealth, that are investing, their, their form of patriotism, they understood what the world was like when Ronald Reagan was helping us beat the Cold War. They understood what communism was in the world. Younger voters, younger Americans, they don't have that historical experience. And they're in a different world where you can see they were impacted by 9-11. They were impacted by the 2008 Obama calls it the Great Recession. Right. It certainly affected their lives. A lot of them have student debt. They're not, you know, that's a big, that's a big problem for them. And uh, now you're seeing these voters, the ones who are just coming of age and voting, you're going to see they're going to be affected by the global pandemic. And we've all been affected by it. And it's changed our lives in a lot of ways. And it's changing our lives even as we speak. People are moving. People are fleeing the cities. Uh, people are some families have gotten closer, but other people, you're talking about there's a greater incidence of depression where children that don't go to school and see their peers and friends, older people that have, uh, you know, haven't seen their friends or family, haven't been able to go to work. There's really, or, or they're worried about their rent, they're worried about yeah. their jobs, they're, there's a, and they're worried about their savings too. Now, fortunately, the president is leading them. You're getting, I spoke to Larry Kudlow yesterday. He says the V-shaped recovery is coming. There's a there is a car buying boom, there's a housing boom right now, which is amazing, which is a great act of faith by America as a country during such challenges that we have not seen probably since the Great Depression. But people forget there was a there was a depression right after World War One that had a V shaped recovery that basically the government didn't interfere and things bounced up and and that's the forgotten depression. But you've got a situation here now where Americans are rebounding. Things are, as the virus starts to subside and we're doing what we have to do, people are, uh, they're optimistic. Jobs are coming back. They want to go back to work. Uh, they see a future where we're going to get vaccines and treatments. And as that grows, these investors that you're talking with, they want to see their values not only produce the returns that they want and hit historic uh, return, historic highs in the markets, and in their investments, but they want to see jobs come back to America. They want to see America stronger, and they want to see their investments help bring that about. Well, we want to stop the hijacking of the American investor. We've seen that happen through ESG, China, and even the companies we invest in seem to be arrayed against our values. So, John, I am so grateful that you did this uh, survey for us. We're going to put it up so you can see the survey he did for us at economicwarroom.com forward slash Whole. And if you go there, you'll be able to see, see all of this good information. But it also leads us to a big question. What do we do about it? So if you're a viewer, you need to check out episode 102 with Justin Danoff. Justin talks about proxy voting and how we can take back our shares and make them work for us and not uh, us working for them. And you can check out episode 101 where Joe Biden talks about stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism, which is de facto socialism, and how uh, Vice President Biden really wants to uh, take your investments and make them work for the good of all society. Uh, or uh, episode 100, which is patriotic investing with Lieutenant General Stephen Quast. Or episode 95 with Dave Bratt, which is on LSV investing, liberty, uh, uh, security, and values. Three things that Americans really care about. And we want to help you get an advisor who can help you. And so you can go to economic war room forward slash advisor and find out how you can get an advisor that will help take your ideals, your values, and put them to practice in your investments. Now we like to talk a lot about the small ships that make a big difference. It's the Dunkirk story. You can be one of those small ships. You can make a difference. You do that by weaponizing your money, your spending, your giving, and your investing. And you can do it as we're launching with Liberty University a training program for advisors. Again, economicwarroom.com forward slash advisor. And you need to get educated. We'll do a full battle plan on this episode at econ and provide it at economicwarroom.com. Remember, what we see as a marketplace our enemies view as a battle space. This is an existential challenge to our liberty. We must rise to the challenge for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. Thank you, John, for bringing us all these insights. We really appreciate it. This is Kevin Freeman from the Economic War Room.